Thanks for taking the time to, to talk to us, and thank you even more for taking a huge amount of time out of your life to write this piece for us. This is your first oratorio, isn't it? Yeah, first big piece of this nature, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and it's I awesome guess we got to know your music organ rep singers through your, I, I guess previously, The Oceans Between Us must be the longest cycle you've written prior to this. And uh, a lot yeah. of our viewers would have seen that. We did an online uh well, it was a live performance, but in a you know in a concert hall with nobody in it, all wearing masks, uh, you know. So the, the performance was all broadcast uh, on video. But I, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm so glad that we're uh, past the mask phase. But man, even even then, like the singers sounded amazing on it, and were yeah. so expressive. Yeah, That's well, yeah. we're just so glad. I mean, everybody loved singing that piece, and the fact that you were willing to take on a project of this scope for our 50th is is just phenomenal. And, uh, I'm so honored that you asked me to begin with. Like, <laughs> it is, it is, uh, that is definitely a, a weight that I acknowledge and, and feel in the best way. Like, I'm, I'm just so grateful. Yeah. And sort of my thoughts in here, I mean, of, of all the living composers uh, out there, and ORS does a lot of work with living composers, but the person we're the closest to as an organization, and then I'm the closest to personally is Morton Lawrence, and I, I studied with him in grad school. He's been up here numerous times. Um, he really got us back into the recording studio and convincing me that uh, a large choir like Oregon Rep Singers really needs to be producing recordings. That we, we can't just have Voces 8 style recordings of, of pieces, of chamber ensembles, that we really need to hear a lot of music as sung by a large choir as well. Uh, so we decided to do his only major oratorio, which is uh, Lux Eterna, as sort of the anchor piece. And I sang in the, in the premiere of, of the Lux Eterna with the LA Master Chorale um, in 1996. And ever since then, I've, I've had a chance to revisit it roughly once a decade in some way, shape, or form. It, it, it always seems to improve, in, in my opinion, with age. It, it seems to be more timeless um, the further that I, that I get away from it. But it's only 25 minutes long. And it's, it's hard to like anchor a concert on a 25-minute piece. And I've heard so many people try to figure out what belongs in the other half with the Lords and Lux Eterna, and so far there is not a standard. So I was like, maybe we could commission it. If we get another piece that really fits with this, one of the things that, that I is always a risk about commissioning is you spend all this time and energy and you get a piece and then nobody else ever does it. And I really wanted to make sure we were going to get a piece that would you know, really enter the repertoire, that it wouldn't just be like about our 50th anniversary. And so I thought like, wow, if we could have something that would fit with the Lords and Lux Eterna. Um, and especially for organ rep singers, everybody loves that piece and it's very beautiful, but we're not an overly religious choir. And actually, Lordson's not an overly religious uh, composer, but that's a very Catholic-y piece uh, with a lot of those, those standard texts. So we wanted to go with something a, a little more secular. And so I reached out to you and I put you in touch with a, a poet friend of mine, Paul Ann Peterson, who used to be the Poet Laureate of Oregon. Um, and I've used her texts a, a couple of times, and then she threw a curveball. So can you tell me what happened after uh, I put you in touch with Paul Ann? Because that's where I sort of exited the picture. Yeah, I, so Paul Ann was amazing. She sent me so many, like the names of all the poets. She sent me her own poetry and these beautiful poems that were like printed with beautiful imagery. And, and I love her text. I was so delighted like to get her poetry and then like i started getting books from different poets that she had gotten in touch with all these different uh oregon poets and there were so many that were beautiful but the one which stood out to me just because it like <laughs> kind of like resonated with my soul was uh sophia mounts who mm -hmm. was a student of paul ann's <laughs> when i first read it it was like looking into a mirror it was talking about some heavy stuff uh you know her journey into climate doom essentially mm -hmm. and uh she's she has gone out into the world and really explored uh nature in different areas and and searched and explored uh the climate and all throughout 
all of this, all throughout, like, you know, reading through these poems, find, trying to find out what to talk about. Uh, I thought about the Lux Eterna, and I thought about the theme of light. As I was looking through the poetry, I think maybe the, the poems that found me, the poems that, like, I related to weren't immediately about that. It was about a different kind of light, which is, it's hard to talk about light when the world as it is, is facing so much darkness. It feels mm -hmm. like to talk about the light and not acknowledge the dark would be, um, it, it would feel incomplete to me. It would, it would kind of devalue that light. And, uh, and for whatever reason, yeah, I just can't think of talking no, about and the light. I, and I think for a lot of us who, who struggle as non-religious people, I think, you know, to some extent, the traditional you know, Catholic reading of the Lux Eterna is like, it's okay if things are dark here in the afterlife, it, it will all be light. And it doesn't necessarily provide an obvious solution for how to make things better in, in the here and now. Yeah, yeah, precisely. I was thinking, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't long ago that we were talking about um, this piece and we were talking about, uh, you know, as, as, as it's come to fruition, so many songs, you find the light as if like, oh yeah, after death but like what what good does it do like let's find the light now let's yeah. let's live in it let's live in that light and so um that's that's been kind of a guiding a guiding theme yeah and and <laughs> this comes across now um i mean i'm in my 50s you're in your 30s or i don't know if that's too personal to answer yeah so, yeah i do think your piece provides a very different view than we see in in oratorios about some of the struggles that, that, that the world is facing, the struggles of, of climate change look different to people who are you know, millennials and Gen Z than they do to Gen X and, and, and older because the consequences, like, you know, a lot of us know we may not live to see the consequences of this. And so I, I think it comes across differently. And, and it's a large thing to, to try to take this on. Um, in your previous piece, the, the Oceans Between Us, there was a lot of personal grief in, in, in that where you, you wrote about processing the death of your father um, and then the so much to see and to seek right to, to to do that and you process that you know in music so personally for all of us to share uh, this is a larger challenge uh, to process yeah. something that seems to be uh, out of all of our control yeah so I you know if you had, if you had to sum it up okay. like okay so you're gonna take us on this road through through climate change you know, when you're going to face us with this big challenge, what, what do you hope we're going to we're going to get at the end? What where 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 are we where are we heading when we get to the end of this journey? If I could sum up what finding light is, it's about the feeling of hopelessness, falling into hopelessness, and then when you reach the bedrock, how do you move on? The thing that I think finding light really explores isn't so much the vastness of climate change as to what does it do to a human being who lives in a world that is constantly on the verge of crisis mm -hmm. or is being told or presented constantly these mammoth problems that they're powerless to solve on their own. Mm -hmm. And so even though it's this, this piece that is referring or reacting to this massive, huge global problem, it what it really is is an exploration of like, what does that do to a person? Mm -hmm. And in telling this story about just one person's reaction to the problems of the world mm -hmm. and making it just really personal and making it almost like a diary or the echoes in your mind or the echoes of your thoughts and these sensations that are hazy and coming from all directions, it makes it so much pers more personal. And I think that my ultimate mission was to explore what is it like to go into the darkness and what light can I find? I mean, it's been a real, it's been a hugely personal journey. Everything I've written, I felt that way. And it's me comprehending those feelings. It's the same reason why I wrote The Ocean Between Us was like me grieving my father. It was mm -hmm. me just connecting with grief, then connecting joy in the wake of grief and connecting with this idea of accepting, like accepting it and letting yourself move on, granting yourself permission to feel joy. I yeah. think it's very, very similar in this piece where it's like, you know, you're not alone in feeling this way. You're not alone in feeling like nihilism and apathy are sometimes the only options that we have mm -hmm. and such a comfort and a light. You're also not alone in beholding the world's problems and being overwhelmed by them. 
because who wouldn't be? Mm -hmm. And also you're not alone in reaching the bedrock of, of existence, of, of hope and finding and letting yourself being completely consumed, be consumed by climate doom. Mm -hmm. As I've been talking to Sophia throughout this entire process, we came to the same conclusion like this past week where she said, I think, I think that every poem is a monument to hope. And mm. that stuck with me so deeply because that's ultimately what this is. Isn't love a kind of action? Even if powerless to stop things from happening, these footprints are happening. It's the act of walking that gives you hope. It is the act of walking that is a source of light. Or the act it of is the living act... or the act of making art, I guess. Yeah, maybe it doesn't even have anything to do with this cosmic scale. And you're just living your best life. You're just being the best human being you can be and doing what's within your power. Hmm. I think that's enough. Yeah. So one of the things I've always felt about Morton Lauritsen, he's in this place that I don't think we've even really acknowledged in the history of the choral art form. Um, I think he might be the first composer since the Renaissance uh, to become famous mainly for writing choral music. Um, Lauritsen's written almost nothing else. Um, and certainly most of the great composers of the 18th and 19th centuries wrote choral music, but they wrote almost exclusively music for chorus and orchestra. And it's generally not their most famous pieces. I mean, Mozart's Requiem is, but again, that's a piece for chorus and orchestra. And he's primarily known as a symphony opera composer. Uh, you know, all of those things. Beethoven's most famous piece with choir is part of a symphony. Um, but like Lauritsen achieves this stature of becoming a really well-known composer, winning the Kennedy Center honors, all of that on being a choral composer, and also by, by being a rebel. Um, Lauritsen grew up in a generation where writing tonal music got you ostracized as a classical composer. And maybe it's because he lived in California like you do and was away from the pressures of New York, um, or he had a teaching job that he could rely on for income, but like Lauritsen obstinately wrote what he wanted to write. All of his music is tonal. And I think he paved the way for a whole generation, obviously most notably Eric Whitaker. Um, but I hear all of these influences in, in your music. I hear others uh, as well. But I don't know where, where uh, you know, talk a little about your influences, what your, you know, when you encountered Lauritsen's music, how you react to it, and then other things we're going to hear in this piece. What other styles, you know, influ that, you know, are going to come through as people hear Finding Light? Oh, man. I, well, with Lauritsen to me is the definition of a warm hug. Mm -hmm. Like his music, especially like that fire chord, it's, it's just, there's something, it's like floating. The sensation of floating is what mm -hmm. I feel through so much of his music. And, and I remember singing O Manu Mysterium uh, when I was in high school and it being the most beautiful piece I had ever sung mm -hmm. uh, up to that point. And then of course, uh, it was only like months later that I, that I heard Eric Whitaker's Sleep mm -hmm. for the first time. And it was, it was tremendously beautiful. I, it's just like one of those lightning storm moments. And I think what he does so beautifully is that he just unlocks the beauty of the human voice. Same thing with Lordson. I think it's when someone writes so beautifully and the, the music is designed to create this ease into beauty, it's intoxicating. I, I would say that, of course, I'm definitely of that generation, heavily influenced by Eric Whitaker, who was in turn writing in uh, in an era like post Lordson. Mm -hmm. And I've always been a huge fan of both. I mean, I just finished my last year, finished my dissertation on uh, Eric Whitaker's A Sacred Veil. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I think any music that you love, any art that you love, and it becomes you, like, I think it's impossible to remove it. I'm sure that there are glimmers of, of the sacred veil. And I definitely know there are glimmers of Lordson in this piece. I'd say my, my influences are also like uh, impossible to ignore. So I'm growing up with video games. Mm -hmm. I think those, those first, um, those first video games I played was my real introduction to 
uh, scoring of any kind. And so that's like driving rhythms. I feel like the end of the world's a kind of weather takes hint from uh, hints from Chrono Trigger for sure. Hear a lot of the sort of yeah. the repetitiveness, yeah, the driving rhythms, and and you know, video game music is unique in that that it doesn't sync up always with the visuals the way it's supposed to. It needs to be a little more free form. And, you know, other than a movie always runs the same way, the, the video game, the music has to keep going and the player might move at a different speed. There's this this need to have, uh, yeah, this sort of unhinged from time kind of feeling. Uh, and a lot of people get it through repetition. Yeah. I see so much of that in there too. And then a, a decent amount of, of Broadway and, and Disney, I think I, I hear uh, in, in what you're writing as well. So I, I, yeah, I grew up with uh, all like box sets of VHSs of Disney movies, like all the Disney cartoons. People point out that would fit in a Disney film. This sounds like The Little Mermaid. This sounds like The Lion King. And it's like, it's undeniable. And I, uh, I don't always realize that that's where it comes from, but I love that it's there. So, uh, Sufjan Stevens' Carrie and Lowell, that came out in 2015. Ever since then, I, I feel like he's, like that that album is my most favorite album of all time, and I've mm. listened to it more than anything in the world. And and I think that it is, it is so a part of me now that it's impossible not to write uh, a piano part or a, a vocal line without just like a glimmer of Sufjan. I've noticed that. And it's like impossible to, to not, um, yeah, Joni Mitchell in there too. So that's, yeah. that is very, very much a part of my language. Yeah. Okay, so I guess if our listeners are, are going to come to Finding Light, I, I hear all of these things you're talking about. We will definitely get that sense of floating like we'll hear in the Lauritsen and Luxa Terna and those ethereal textures. We'll hear uh, a lot of the driving rhythms uh, from, from video games and a lot of these scoring textures that, that come out of that. And then just a lot of hope with this rather serious subject matter that seems incongruous, but I think has wound up being something very profound. And... I think important for the world to start hearing more from younger generations about where we are uh, artistically and emotionally. And uh, yeah, I have a couple of singers who said like they think this piece is going to be really impactful in 25 years. That you know, looking back, that this will have been an important statement to to have made at this moment. We'll we'll find out, I guess, at Oregon Repertory Singer 75th uh, anniversary concert uh, <laughs> when we get to that along the way. Matt, thank you so much for taking the time to talk uh, to us and, and, and uh, to write all of this for us. And, and for our listeners, this is a unique thing. Only the second time in 50 years that we have commissioned an oratorio. Come hear the world premiere of Finding Light on April 27th or April 28th. That's a Saturday and Sunday afternoon, 4 p.m. concerts as usual at the new Research Center uh, for the Performing Arts out in Beaverton. And uh, it's gonna be really spectacular. You'll have the Oregon Repertory Singers Adult Choir, the Youth Choir, the Portland Youth Philharmonic Camarada. Um, it's a lot of performers and it's a big spectacle as it should be for our 50th anniversary. And couldn't be more excited. Thanks for talking to us. And uh, we're excited to have you in town for the premiere. So excited. Thank you so much, Ethan. I, from asking me to do this to walking me through, the, like walking alongside me through the entire journey. It's, it's been priceless. Yeah. It's, it's truly been. It's really so, special. Thank you. Thank you.